That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Ambulance. Ambulance. <laughs> the 15th film directed oh. by Michael Bay, uh, which <laughs> Universal is releasing uh, April 8th, 2022. Uh, this is considered a smaller film from Michael Bay. Uh, and uh, as he's still trying to step out of his uh, own self-imposed shadow, the, the Transformers franchise. And you know what you can't spell uh, Ambulance without? L.A. As the poster will tell us, this is an L.A. car chase story. Notably, it's uh, based on a 2005 Danish film. Oh. Uh, yet another uh, American adaptation of a Danish film starring Jake Gyllenhaal after The Guilty last year. Um, I'll say I enjoyed... I didn't love this film and I have a lot of issues with it, but it has some fun moments. I agree. I think it was a fun ride... For a moment. But the film's long. It's two hours, 15? Two hours and 16 minutes, yeah. So it definitely feels very long. And about two hours of it is like a, a straight-on chase film. Yeah. But not as good as something like Mad Max Fury Road. Um, this makes you feel like uh, you'll need a Xanax. Oh, 100%. But let me tell the basic story. So Jake Gyllenhaal and Yahya Abdul-Mateen II. Very good. Mm-hmm. Who I know from Candy, the Candyman reboot. Yeah, he was an Aquaman. Uh, he played Bobby Seale in Trial of the Chicago 7. Okay. Uh, those two are brothers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not blood brothers, but they're brothers, as they say. And Jake's character is involved in some nefarious things. And we find out that their dad was like a notorious bank robber. Yaya's character is a good guy. He's a veteran. He's married with a kid. His wife is in need of some treatment that's considered experimental, so insurance won't pay for it. So we're made to understand he's sort of in desperate need of money. So he goes to his brother, played by Jake, who has access to money, and Jake ropes him into this bank robbery, like the biggest heist he's ever done. <laughs> he just happens to show up on the day. Although... He's been trying to get a hold of him, but Th that that that's true. So it, it's unclear how far in advance Will Yaya's character knew about this bank robbery that's going on today, basically. So they're going to rob a bank in downtown LA with a jackpot of thirty-two million dollars. So they go, the shit goes left, a bunch of people get killed, but Jake and Yaya are able to escape by carjacking an ambulance. And the ambulance they're driving has a paramedic in it, played by... Isaac Gonzalez. Cam Thompson is her name. And a cop who Jake... No, who Yaya shot by accident. Who's in need of, like, medical attention. Mm -hmm. So the four of these people are driving around L.A. for two hours, evading the cops. And the chief of police is played by... I thought that was Josh Duhamel. Uh, Who's that? I think he's the SWAT captain. Oh, SWAT captain. Garrett Dillahunt. Uh, Do captain, I know him? Captain Monroe. Oh, you've seen him in all kinds Doesn't of stuff. Doesn't he look like Josh Duhamel? At, well, with his sunglasses on, and he's kind of obfuscated by that dog in his car. Yeah, at first Ugh. I thought it was uh, Duhamel as well, but no, that's Garrett Dillahunt, uh, who's an actor, his character actor that I really like. Okay, so it's just chase, 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 and then the end is the ambulance pulls up to the hospital. They get out. Jake's character is shot. Yaya's character is shot, but it, we're made to believe that, and the cop who was shot is taken in for medical attention. Jake is left for dead, and Yaya's taken in. The end. Yeah. That's it. In a nutshell. Oh, and then, you know, because the whole, the whole, the entire reason Yaya's in this predicament is because he needs like $250,000 for his wife's surgery. So during this long chase, they have like $16 million in cash in the ambulance. And Yaya takes like a big pack of money, which probably is like a million dollars, and gives it to the paramedic and says, get this to my wife. So the f so in the end, we see the paramedic put the money in like the baby stroller. <laughs> we need to talk about this poor wife in every scene we see her in, but we'll get to it. But anyway, that's the basic story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the glaring errors are uh, how it treats its women characters and uh, uh, its racial others in this film. Should I just go through my sure. notes? We're made to understand... So Will's a veteran. It's not very clear like if he was discharged from the military or 
he just seems in dire straits. It's very generic. And then his role in the military, because we're told early on he can drive, Yaya can drive anything. Mm -hmm. But then when... I'm a good driver. When the paramedic needs his assistance for like, because they're doing surgery in the ambulance at a high rate of speed via like Zoom, because she's not a physician, but she has a backstory about medical school and flunking out because she was a crackhead. And then her ex-boyfriend is like a surgery surgeon in residency. That scene was crazy. We'll talk about that. Okay. But at that point, we're also made to understand that Yaya was like a medical tech. He made it seem like he is experienced in that as a skill that you needed to know in the field. The is what I thought. The writing of this is like, whoever the, wrote it maybe isn't fully knowledgeable on all the things they're writing about. <laughs> uh, it's a screenwriter named Chris Fedak, uh, who heretofore has only written for television. Okay. And I think that is obvious, uh, especially with the finale. The opening scene is the paramedics, so the lady and then her partner, who gets taken out. When the ambulance is carjacked, the male ambulance driver, who's played by... Uh, Colin Waddell. They knock his ass out and Yaya's driving. But the opening scene of the film is the two paramedic ambulance drivers. They show up to the scene of like a, a really bad car accident and a young girl is impaled. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a good scene for like an action movie that has like heart and you know that scene did make me kind of teary-eyed because the way that lady the ambulance lady was treating the little girl the EMT Isaac Gonzalez Cam Thompson yeah yeah that lady is stunning He's, like Megan Fox level well this is a Megan Fox composite of a character in a it really is film. but you've seen her in things like what she was uh, in Cutthroat City the RZA film that she's horribly miscast in if you go back and review what we wrote about, said about I her. I watched that movie? Yeah. Is that the one where Terrence Howard and Ethan Hawke seem gay? Mm-hmm. Oh, I was distracted by uh, T.I.'s vitiligo. Yeah. That's probably why I don't remember this lady. She's And she's also um, Roseman Pike's uh, nefarious girlfriend in I Care A Lot, which was a good role for her. Oh, I didn't know that. But she's stunning. I think... The writing's terrible for her character. Well, let's get let's start with that then. Uh, I think. But that, getting back to that scene, yes, her handling the little girl, I thought was a very sweet scene. Uh, but they give her a regressive character arc, uh, I think, because through that scene, the, the, it's this high octane scene that's really at the speed of something like uh, Chicago Hope or ER. Really, this is it's a well done TV movie scene. Sure. Uh, her uh, novice partner is like just amped and she goes well i know a place where there's good enchiladas let's go like she's not phased and and she there's this scene there's this exchange where they, she has i think well established boundary issues in her job like she she right. she provided excellent care uh, to this child and or as all the people it seems like she comes across and after they're out of her ambulance she's done with them and that's it cuz he's like oh i'm going to call and see if the girl's okay and she's like no no i don't care and we, by after her grueling experience, uh, her final scene is going to see this little girl in the hospital. As in, she has become feminized. She's been reminded. To me, that message was she's reminded that she has to be a woman and care about those things and take time out of her day to check on these patients. Um, yeah, that's a good point because I think her initial approach was the professional approach. Yes, <laughs> like and she was being professional. So yeah, that's interesting. Like like she's become more. She she's seen as like a cool, hard person. And I didn't I didn't get that at all. So the Transformers movies, I stopped watching them because they're too damn long and they're too damn loud. I do like CGI heavy movies. I love Transformers as a kid, so I was on board with the first one, but progressively just got tired of the same thing for long periods of time. But I think this movie feels like this, like, my, like it almost feels like a Fast and Furious movie in that a lot of the plot points, like it's over dramatic. There's comedic moments when there shouldn't be. The writing's bad. You know what's funny? Michael Bay started out as a music video director, and I can't think of anybody that seems less ill-equipped to uh, at soundtrack and, and more ill score yeah. like this score in this by Lorne Balfe, who did the Tomorrow War score. Uh, it is. Just pulse pounding the well, whole time. Like it's... I wanted to say that aside from the writing, I think the worst part of the film is the camera work. Uh, first, it's nauseating. First time cinematographer who's done documentaries before, Roberto De Angelis. But you can tell that this was Bay's. Bay wanted him to do this. And even from the jump with the conversation between the two brothers, this camera is a, a whirling dervish and it, it's nonsensical. Well, that's the problem. Like they're, they're not flourishes. Every scene of this movie is 
someone trying to do some interesting camera work, but it doesn't make sense. The angles from which we approach, like, the cars. It's like, is there some, like, dragonfly flying around L.A. that's, like, zooming well, in? the bank robbery scene where we're, we're, like, diving down from the top of the building... For what? For what? Because I almost thought that like someone was going to drop a boulder on that man's head like death on the Nile. But no, it's just a weird choice in camera work. Like, It's, it's to uh, force a, a feeling of spectacle where there is none because Michael Bay doesn't know how to be quiet and let a film breathe. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have thoughts about Jake Gyllenhaal. I don't necessarily care for him, but I don't, I don't dislike him. I think he looks good in this movie for him. Like, he's very well put together. He's handsome. He is giving a performance that, to me, feels like he's stepping into Nicolas Cage territory. I th- because he's screaming. He's screaming every line. I, I also think Michael Bay doesn't re- isn't really good at directing actors. And I think that Jake Gyllenhaal is woefully miscast in this as, as kind of this hell-bent uh, maniac of a character. I also think that they... Um, edited out his sexuality. Okay. So I think that Jake's character is supposed to be gay Mm -hmm. for a a number of reasons. Um, He's very put together. He mentions that like, oh my God, you messed up my cashmere sweater. uh, A a few little things, but the biggest thing is that there's an FBI agent Mm -hmm. who's sort of taken over this chase. And that character we are told is gay because we see him with his partner at a therapy session, which is terrible. That's We need to talk about that scene too. But, so... This gay FBI agent then tells the SWAT team manager, whatever, that he went to college with Jake and that they were buddies. They used to drink rosé together. They used to drink rosé together. So it's like, okay. And then when the FBI agent is talking to Jake, they seem like they're two bitchy queens to each other. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think that's very interesting. And I think that maybe because so then it seems clear to me that the fact that Jake's character is gay was cut out because his character has zero backstory. Yeah, it's like that was his that was his defining backstory, and they cut it out probably because even though he's played a very, uh, I guess, iconic gay character, oh, broke back mouth, Jack Twist, Jack Nasty. Uh, maybe they wanted to avoid like being accused of gay face in this, and or the problem of having a, a maniac villain, kind of, but. Which doesn't bother me, but uh, it's kind of like what they did to Pierce Brosnan in The Matador. Like, uh, many, many people. Um, We're told that the paramedic lady, she is the best paramedic in town. Yeah, that was... She can keep anyone alive for 20 minutes, but no one wants to work with her. So that's her backstory. Plus, she, again, medical school, dropout, ex-boyfriend, surgeon. Was addicted to speed. Speed. Um, Which is funny, because this film feels like speed grafted onto Paul Haggis' crash. Okay. And another thing about Jake Gyllenhaal's casting, you need somebody like the villains in the Speed movies, like a Dennis Hopper or Willem Dafoe, who are really good at channeling this kind of energy when, and also seeming human. Sure. Sure. Okay. A plot point that I thought was ridiculous, but I don't know, kind of cute, was that the cop who ends up getting shot, the reason his ass got shot was he was somewhere he wasn't supposed to be, he has a crush on one of the bank tellers at this mm-hmm. bank that had $32 million. And he convinces his partner to drive back to the bank. Or no, his partner says, no, dude, if you want this girl, you got to go get her. <laughs> like, they're fucking cavemen. So they drive back to the bank. And when they get to the bank door, the bank is closed. And he starts pounding on it. And then Jake Gyllenhaal comes out pretending to be the bank manager, wearing a name badge that says he's the hotel manager. So Jake is like, what's up? And he says, I really need to open an account. Please help me. Like, I promise I won't rob the joint. Jake lets his ass in. The bank is dead quiet. There's no one working because everyone's like on the ground with guns pointed at them. And the cop goes up to the lady teller and asks her out. But then he realizes that the name Jake told him was not the name, her name. And then he realizes something's wrong. He gets hemmed up. And then everything goes left. The, the need for the ambulance is him getting shot. And then the need. So I thought, you know, I actually would like to see the Danish film this is based on. I would too. It stars the guy that played the racist brother in the celebration, Thomas something. I'm forgetting his name. I was so annoyed. Again, like these choices that are made. The SWAT team manager man, he's driving around in like a little, like, it, it looks like, a, like an old school mini. Like a mm-hmm. car that's too small for an adult to sit in. Mm-hmm. And then you have this big ass man 
wearing what he's trying to look cool with his USC sweatshirt on and fatigues. He looks so stupid. And we see him driving around town in this miniature car mm -hmm. with this enormous dog. St. Bernard, right? Is it? No, I think it's like a Mastiff. Is it Mastiff? Whatever. Okay. It's a huge yes, dog yeah. that's like stinking up the place because they had like in Mongolian. Mongolian. All the, the all the dialogue is is really kind of quite bad or nonsensical. Again, because I don't think Michael Bay is comfortable in silence. Like there's one point where Garrett Dillahunt says something like, you know that you know that feeling when you're playing hide and seek and you're about to get caught? I'm good at giving people that feeling. What? Okay, you can talk about the gay couple therapist. My <laughs> uh, again, again, where we're demeaning, I think, women, women and femininity, because uh, it the the more it's clear that the partner that wants the therapy is feeling ignored, and his husband can only talk about the bad guys at home uh, and bank robbers. And the therapist goes, "Do people even rob banks anymore?" And then he uh, cured O'Donnell. Like he gets a text message. Well, he's like, "Do we have to pay for these stupid questions?" Yeah. Uh, but really, I think the film is more egregious in how it handles Moses Ingram, who plays uh, Yaya's wife. That poor lady. The opening scene. He is clearly having a hard time getting through, and also I think you could classify this film as a veteran exploitation, <laughs> with which uh, along the same with Chris Pine and the Contractor, and even that John Boyega film Eight Ninety Two, which is a much better film than this. Uh, he's clearly having a struggle getting through on the phone and upset, and his wife is like, "Is everything fine? Oh, okay, good." <laughs> they just she seems like such a simpleton. It is it it's aggravating. And every scene we see her and she's just holding that baby. She's holding the baby. Looking like I'm so proud of my husband. I know he'll make sure everything's okay. She's watching on the news this uh And she's watching the chase. The on chase the news. happened and he calls her at one point and she's like, Oh, you got the job as the driver. You I hear you driving now. I'm so proud of you. Oh my god, oh my god. so <laughs> stupid. Um okay, so oh, there's so many the cops chasing the ambulance, these have to be the worst drivers on earth. It's just nothing but cops crashing everywhere. We live in LA. I've seen many, I grew up in LA. You know how many of the car chases I've seen on TV? You have never seen a cop car crash on live TV. And in this movie, it's like, there had to be at least a hundred cop cars crash. They just run into like blocks and walls. And it, it it's ridiculous on a level that almost makes it amusing it mm -hmm. but again it's too damn long okay so the cop in the ambulance who's been shot is losing a lot of blood mm -hmm. and the paramedic lady keeps saying he needs blood and then i think it's funny he's still like leaking somewhere and it's like an hour in where she finally realizes he was there's another wound <laughs> okay we'll get to that but before that she's like he needs blood and yaya says oh i'm o negative or whatever and she goes oh that's his blood type we need to do a transfusion so while they're driving this ambulance at high rates of speed, flipping and crashing and turning, she like draws blood. From, she has a line connected from Yaya to the cop and he's like giving him blood. And then she has to um, open up his abdomen. Okay, uh, so this is when she calls her ex-boy. We find out it's not her actual boyfriend. They haven't spoken in six months. Mm -hmm. And he's in scrubs, eating mm -hmm. breakfast, getting ready to go to the hospital. So he's not like an attending surgeon, he's in residency, which I think is important because he goes, well, let me call some other people I know. So he calls another doctor who's on the golf course and this doctor is a trauma surgeon mm -hmm. and he's on the course with another physician. So now we have three physicians on a call and she's using her laptop and somehow she, like HIPAA regulations have gone out the window because somehow she's on a work computer that's able to transmit all of this person's like medical information and vitals i thought that was crazy but they're all looking via the camera while she performs surgery that's the i mean it's just so outlandish that again it's amusing and that officer wakes up later and he, he no he wakes up while she has his yeah, hand yeah, and he, in her and abdomen yes right and yaya has to punch him out so he's unconscious because she doesn't have any this, um, anesthesia the, she has to clamp the aorta together with her hair clip her hair clip her claw clip and, claw then, clip. and then maybe like an hour after that he wakes up he's like hey was your hand inside me looking vibrant looking crisp he looks crisp <laughs> yes Okay, so That's many things. so ridiculous. So the turning point of the... Because, you know, obviously it's like, well, how is this ambulance ever going to get away? Like helicopters, cameras, GPS, they're never going to get away. So Jake calls like some other nefarious person who used to be friends with Jake's did now dead okay. cat. Poppy. Pa yeah. Played by A. Martinez, who I used to have a crush on as a kid from She-Devil. That's him? That's him, yeah. 
Oh, he kind of fell off. Well, and we recently watched after that <laughs> Night Hunter documentary, he was in that TV movie, uh, Manhunt, Night Stalker. <gasps> he looked good in that. Yeah, that was the same year. Yeah, I think. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's him? Yeah, that's him. Wow. Looking a little like uh, Latino Josh Brolin, I thought. but Well, not Josh Brolin still looks good. That's true. Anyway. Uh, okay, yeah. this plot point involves Poppy. Oh, it's so... I mean, again, it's so ridiculous that it's kind of entertaining because Jake's plan is there is a depot of ambulances and he finds out through the paramedic lady that ambulances keep the key in the, in the truck for quick, you know, mm-hmm. get up and go. So his plan is we're going to drive to this lot and we're going to like, because it's like a military tactic that Yaya shares that like we all come out of like, you know, we're covered so that the enemy can't see us. And then all of a sudden... 10 of us disperse and they don't know who to chase. So he's going to get Poppy and his men to do that. So we think is the audience. But really, uh, this felt like Fast and the Furious, like that one scene where the plane is on the runway for half an hour or whatever. Sadly, I know that that's in the sixth one, I think. Oh my God, because he says at one point, like you have like five minutes to get here, three minutes. But literally we see these like Poppy guys building vehicles. Like (laughs) it's so stupid. But then it culminates with the ambulance getting to this depot or whatever. And there are a bunch of ambulances ready to disperse. And then Poppy's guys have like a booby trap set up where they assault a bunch of police and set off grenades. And, and Garrett Dillahunt gets killed. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, even though it was insane, I did find it entertaining. I do think the best, the comedy does not work on any level except Jake... His character has an assistant who looks like T Pain. Uh, that's a musician, Castro, played by Whale. I think he was the best part of the movie. He, I, I thought his character was funny. I guess, I, if anything, he understood the assignment best. Perhaps. He understood the assignment, and there's one scene because he does. He shows up because Jake tells him, "You need to bring paint to paint our ambulance a different color. Bring blue paint." And this motherfucker brings like neon green paint. So he's painting the ambulance. And he's painting the windshield. It makes no sense. But then Jake says, here's 10,000. Get in that ambulance and drive away. And if the police pull you over, just say you don't know how you got in there. Which is like so stupid. Well, I'm going to catch a felony case over for $10,000. And, here, and here's the other thing that my major problem with this is that scene where it's like you clearly don't give a, a, a damn about your black employee dealing with the police sure. that are more likely to shoot him and but then your brother's and black your, and your black ass brother that you are so close with that you kill all of Poppy's friends when they suggest that he's not your he's real your brother he's your pretend brother but you, at one point there's that not, at any point that you think I if I care for this man my brother this this black man and involve him uh, in a situation where if it came between both of us they'd probably shoot him over me you uh, know what I can already read the comments that were like thinking too much about this story it's important because i agree but as is the final scene where you have the the officer in the um zach, officer zach he's the one that shot in the car his <laughs> he's white uh played by jackson white his partner's black and there is a sequence where at, at the very end they pull out the brothers who are bleeding out on the ground about to die and there's a, a circle of police uh all kinds of law enforcement members that are refusing to help them Oh my God. So you have this black man looking at another black man bleeding out on the ground that's refusing to help him. That was very upsetting to me because I don't, is that even legal that if you have two perpetrators or people, you know, assailants who will be charged, whatever, and they're injured, aren't we like obligated to provide them with medical attention? Of course, medical they're, attention? they're trying to make a point about the blue line, right? That would upset me a lot because yes, like, yes, because... They're watching these two men injured on the ground and they need assistance. And then even when the paramedic lady says we need to help them and they're trying to stop her. Yeah, she it's only through <laughs> her force of will that she she hoists Yahya abdul That was wild. Uh, but, yes, but the optics of that are like... But I did want to say the funniest moment in the movie to me is when that T-Pain looking man, he does get in the ambulance and drive off. And of course he gets pulled over. And they drag his ass out of the ambulance, have him at gunpoint. And he's like... I don't know how this happened. Like I went to the doctor and I needed medicine and they, t- or I needed help. And they told me, go drive yourself to the hospital. And, <laughs> and so that's why he said an ambulance to go to the hospital. I thought that was funny. And that love, like, uh, we, we, we can talk about how this could have been better at the end, but I just want to finish my notes. 
at the peak of the chaos, like when there's no hope, it just seems like they are going to perish. Jake and Yaya in this ambulance. Jake is like, I need to calm down. So he puts on his air uh, pods <sighs> and he starts listening to that song Sailing by the artist whose name I can't recall, but InSync redid it. Um, and then Yaya says, I want some of that. So they share air pods and they start singing this song. <sighs> It, but again, it was like, it was kind of amusing because I do like that song, but then it's so ridiculous. And then in that scenario, in that situation, like the, I, also the use of Calif the California Dreaming cover from the Mamas and the Papas is like... Also, Jake's stunt double did not look like him. And it was very obvious to me in the scenes where they're in the LA River and he's shooting at the helicopter that that was not Jake in that car. Um, that's all I have. Um, oh no, lastly, when Jake... And Yaya and the ambulance get to the hospital and all the police are there ready to shoot their asses. Before they even get out of the ambulance, the police bring Yaya's wife and child to the scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, cop, <laughs> there's a cop carrying the kid's car seat too. Like, that was crazy. Uh, that was yes. crazy. Uh, it's just a very manic film. But we didn't even talk about um, Lieutenant, how did, how did you say her name? J Jahig with the hair. That's monitoring the traffic. You know what? I forgot about that because that character was so annoying. It's got the, a very like fast-paced Gilmore Girls staccato dialogue between her and Gary. It's Dillon. trying so hard. And then it's also there's um, interesting commentary that they feel they had to make about her hair. Uh, and then she's hitting on SWAT manager man. Ugh, it's that that. Char those both of those characters and that scenario were so cringy. I had I also had to laugh because Dill Hunt refers to them as a couple of smart LA boys. Like, not really. There's just nothing that makes sense here. Like the 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 level of fraternity between these these two brothers, Jake Gyllenhaal's how he went to school and yet is leaving the leading this life of crime to follow in his father's footsteps, even though he's doing quite well. It seems like for thirty two million, sixteen, if you will, if they're dividing it. I, I we saw it at the IMAX theater in Universal C at City Walk. Mm -hmm. I do think this needs to be seen in a theater. I can't imagine watching it at home unless you have a really strong system because the sound is really. I mean, it's grating at a point, but I I I I think without that, it just it's not sophisticated enough to. Well, I don't know. There were some thrills. It is, well, especially compared to Michael Bay's other films which there's a lot of a hooey in there. Uh, it's watchable. It's cohesive. Uh, it, it does have a great production design. Uh, and, and for what, if you like chase films, it's very escapist fair. It's just that why can't he pay the same level of detail to storytelling? The script. Would I watch it again? If someone picked me up, bought my ticket, got me some red vines and a Slurpee, and then took me to get real food after, I would watch it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I this seems like something that would have been better directed by somebody like a Tony Scott or which Tony Scott directed what well his last movie before he killed himself was Unstoppable oh but you know Top Gun his first film is my favorite The Hunger he also directed Domino about Domino Harvey uh, based on that real life assassin daughter of Lawrence Harvey and they cut out her uh, lesbianism in that film <laughs> I thought the person who directed that alligator movie What's the crawl? Who directed that? Alexander Aja. I think he could have done a good Who job. Who did high with this. tension? I think he could have done a good job with this. Yeah, I, maybe. I, I just don't think Michael Bay is a very interesting director. But what would you give it? Um, two out of five. I would give it two out of five as well. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>